Jay Stores Hall is a well-known writer on nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, machine ethics, and other future technology-related topics. He appears in Ray Kurzweil's movie, The Singularity is Near. Dr. Hall was the founding chief scientist of Nanorex, Inc., and recently served as president of the Foresight Institute. He is best known in science fiction circles for speculative inventions such as utility fog and the weather machine, and in technical circles for ones like adiabatic logic. To us mere humans, this is a way to do energy efficient computation. Please welcome Dr. J. Storrs Hall. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here. In 1644, the Renaissance scientist Torricelli discovered the atmosphere. He wrote, we live submerged at the bottom of an ocean of air. Nobody had seen things quite that way before. Torricelli created the first artificial vacuum using mercury in a glass tube. By 1656, with these concepts in hand, the vacuum pump had been invented, and the force of a vacuum was demonstrated with the famous Magdeburg hemispheres. Two teams of eight horses could not pull them apart, even though the only thing holding them together was the fact that the air inside had been pumped out. Surely the force of eight horses could be harnessed to do something useful. And indeed it could. Within 50 years, vacuum, created by the condensation of steam, was drawing down the pistons in the new engines which launched the Industrial Revolution. Low-pressure steam drove the world for a century until knowledge gained from experience, metallurgy and high-precision machining as well as thermodynamics, allowed the use of high-pressure steam engines which were small and light enough to pull a train. Science and technology are alternate footsteps. Each discovery and invention builds on its predecessors and enables its successors. Left foot, science, the discovery of the atmosphere. Right foot, technology, steam power. Left foot, science, thermodynamics. Right foot, technology, every fuel burning engine that powers the modern world. It's the same today. Left foot, the structure of DNA is a binary coded tape. Right foot, for Neumann's self-reproducing automaton. Left foot, our basic understanding of the molecular machines that form the very mechanism of life. Right foot, still in the process of stepping, nanotechnology. This is a vast simplification, of course, but there is a clearly discernible pattern to technological progress. Inventions lead to discoveries, discoveries lead to inventions. These alternating waves of innovation happen on larger scales as well. The printing press was in no small part responsible for the growth and development of science itself. And science led, in turn, to the Industrial Revolution. Now here's an interesting statistic. Once the printing press became widespread and the Enlightenment got underway, scientific work, as measured by the number of publications, shifted into an exponential growth mode with a rate of 5% per year. And here's another interesting statistic. Once the Industrial Revolution got going, overall economic growth in industrial economies also jumped into a 5% mode. Well, guess what? The printing press of the next wave is here today. It is, of course, the computer and the internet, the modern information technology. And we all know the growth rate that's associated with it, Moore's Law, which is about 60% per year, a doubling in a year and a half, a factor of 100 every decade. When I first met Eric Drexler, I complained to him that he had ruined science fiction for me. He laughed and replied that if it was any consolation, he had ruined it for himself as well. <laughs> it's really hard to get your head around what it would be like to live in a society in which the overall economy, including capital stocks, productivity, and personal income, were all increasing at 60% a year. Virtually all of classic science fiction assumes an overall growth rate roughly the Industrial Revolution standard. It's just one of those basic background assumptions that everybody takes for granted. But if the pattern repeats itself, with the information technology a foretaste of the physical, that's what's coming in the coming century. 
But wait just a minute. If we are on the verge of a major takeoff in physical technology, shouldn't it have been accelerating already? Whereas on the contrary, in many ways, physical tech seems to have decelerated instead over the past half century. Where's my flying car? Where's the limitless power of the atom? Why does 2001 A Space Odyssey look so retro with its Pan Am passenger lighter to a rotating space station? <laughs> Commercial airliners got faster on a beautiful exponential trend up to 1970 and then flatlined. The general aviation industry collapsed under a flood of litigation, also in the 70s. With new, safer, more efficient designs right at our fingertips, we simply abandoned nuclear power. We put a man on the moon, returned him safely to the Earth, and stopped. It's as if we were in the classic Heinlein story, but the bad guys won. <laughs> By any objective, physical, social, or economic standard whatsoever, our lives here and now are better than any humans anywhere have ever had. And yet, our culture has become strangely, I would even say weirdly, pessimistic since the 60s. We have had a failure of nerve. We have somehow lost our faith in the future. We're scared of it. And our science fiction, instead of lighting our way to a better world, slouches down into a morose morass. So, are we on the verge of a great technological takeoff or not? The deceleration is real, at least in some aspects. Econo economist Tyler Cowen claims that we entered what he calls the great stagnation around 1970. Recently, there have been various economists claiming that we become a zero-sum society. But a zero-sum society is a disaster. It's a recipe not merely for stagnation, but for major dysfunction. One of the great discoveries of the 20th century was that there are evolutionary pressures that produce cooperation even between purely self-interested individuals but only if their interactions are non-zero-sum. The point is intuitively clear. In a zero-sum society, everything you get must be taken from someone else. For every winner, there must be a loser. People will spend more effort trying to keep what they have and less creating, inventing, and building. It's a society of takers, not of makers. Does a zero-sum society deprive us of our moral compass and rudder? This is a much deeper question than I can answer. But zero-sum definitely deprives us of the wind in our sails that has driven Western civilization since we emerged from the Dark Ages. L. Ron Hubbard, endowing and chartering this great contest, said something profound that I think has only grown in importance since he said it. He said, a culture is as rich and capable of surviving as it has imaginative artists. The artist injects the spirit of life into a culture. What this means is that the artist has a very deep and abiding duty to his or her culture. The duty of the artist and the duty of the science fiction writer in particular is to inject that spirit of life. No, technological progress has not stopped. Computers have been improving beyond the wildest dreams of science fiction. Robots are busting out all over. Virtually every home has a visi plate that would make Hugo Gernsback's jaw drop. Progress toward the desktop factory is palpable. If you haven't seen what the latest high-end 3D printers can do, you owe yourself a look. Even private space travel looks to be on the verge of a renaissance. On the other hand, or rather foot, We've been waiting for the right foot shoe to drop in the stagnant technologies. Yes, we should have flying cars. Yes, we should have power too cheap to meter. Yes, we should have orbital hotels. But what has actually happened is that we've been building up a left foot theoretical scientific overhang. We should have been developing nanotechnology since 1960 when Richard Feynman first pointed out the possibilities. We know a lot more about the molecular scale now, so when it does come, it will come a lot faster. We have system designs for self-replicating nanofactories. We have detailed atom-for-atom -atom designs and engineering analyses of gears, levers, bearings, shafts, and sprockets. 
It's as if we had gone into the Industrial Revolution already knowing thermodynamics and high temperature metallurgy. When the right foot does come down, there will be an explosion of physical capability, full-fledged nanotechnology that will be literally indistinguishable from magic. At the same time, the relentless advance of information science is poised to give us full-fledged artificial intelligence. What we don't have is a vision, a purpose, a challenge. Our failure of nerve was caused in part by a failure of the imagination. We don't see anything compelling enough to do to make us get up off our rapidly softening rear ends and get to work. In the Industrial Revolution, they did. Virtually everybody lived at the edge of starvation, and one bad year could to UN. How can we possibly be more pessimistic than those people? <laughs> but they had one thing we don't, a vision of a future that was better than their present in a big, meaningful way. Our culture will be richer and more capable of surviving if we can reclaim their legacy. Does anyone here seriously believe that mankind has fought our last major war? Do you think that the surface of the Earth would be a good place to fight another one with nuclear, nanotech, and genetically engineered weapons? The asteroids alone converted into space colonies could provide 20,000 times the living space that Earth does. We could spread out, preserve the Earth as a park, and take our fights outdoors. <laughs> Technology has a balance. It brings the power to destroy, but also to create. The power to get away. The power to find and to build new worlds. To keep that balance, we need to develop constructive abilities as fast as we do destructive ones. We need to see a future worth constructing. We do need that vision, that purpose, that challenge. We need people to envision worlds worth living in and worlds worth striving for. We need something important to do with the almost unimaginable creative power that is coming. We need our artists, our writers, and our dreamers as never before. We need you. <laughs>